anybody here who doesn't have a Book of Mormon. You have to have a Book of Mormon. That's all we're here for. It's to study the Book of Mormon, not listen to me, but to look at the text of the Book of Mormon closely. And uh, here, where you are. And follow it carefully. Because it has a great deal to say. After all, this was hand delivered by an angel. And there's every evidence that it was. And let's look at it. I've got to find out here. Oh, here we are. I had lost my note out of it. We're in the ninth chapter <coughs> and the fourth verse. Oh, no, and the eighth verse. Uh, we mentioned the infinite atonement and so forth. Then, I, I'd said that this was a concise summary, that this was a, this was a shocking verse. What is the justification for saying a thing like this? Well, all you have to do is look around you and see it's true. But look what it is. Our spirits must come like him. Notice there's nothing in between here. Uh, <coughs> comes later here. I, we must have crumbled and rotted in that. And then he says, Our spirits must have become like unto him, and we become devils, angel to the devil. That's some choice. To be shut out. See, that's the opposite of atonement. To be shut out from the presence of our God and to remain with the father of lies in misery. You notice that combination, misery and lies. What is the Lord full of? Everybody. Grace and truth. Well, what's the opposite of that? Misery and lies. Of course, the opposite of misery, grace is misery. The opposite of truth is lies. And he's the father of, of lies and misery, like unto himself. Yea, to that being who beguiled our first parents, <coughs> who transformeth himself nigh unto an angel of light, and stirreth up the children of men unto secret combinations of murder and all manners of secret works of darkness. Well, what's this angel of light business got to do with? That's very important to put that in there. He transformeth himself into an angel of light. He is not a Halloween horror. He is among us. He's one of the boys. He's right in the system. In fact, the system is his. That's how he's able to form the secret combinations of murder and all manner of secret works of darkness that fill the world today. Uh, remember, he told us when he lost his temper what he was going to do. He was going to take money and buy up the power and rule in a horrible way upon this earth, and that's what he's done. Can you think of any, make a long list of all the major crimes and follies of our times, uh, drugs, um, militarism, uh, uh, all sorts of crime, sex, everything else, can you name any one of them that has money behind it? He says, well, you can have anything in this world for money, and I'm the one that's, that has it. And that's how he's able to gain this control. That's what he says he'll do. He says he'll buy up the authority, the power, the kings and presidents, armies and navies, and he'll rule that way. So he can't move. He has a very powerful, a very powerful tool to use, and he's using it very effectively today. You say, we, see, this is very clear today. Look, we're talking about elections now. What wins elections now? Every expert will tell us money. That's the answer. That will get you into office. So everybody's going crazy building up these chests and so forth. Isn't it silly? Well, but here we are. As I say, if this sounds like an exaggeration, as it certainly sounded like not long ago, uh, but it doesn't sound like it anymore. We're warming up. These are the last days. And no, then he's happy. How great the goodness of our God who prepared a way from our escape from the grasp of this awful monster. Yea, that monster, death and hell, which I call the death of the body and the death of the spirit. That awful monster, death and hell. Polos dipti mustricas aidi proiapsum, says Homer, remember. Many noble souls all caught like rats in a trap. Caught before, ahead of time. They have not, haven't got a chance to get out. See, that's the way he describes life, and that's why Gertie says, you see, that Homer teaches us that life on this earth is a hell. But this is the point. All these noble souls, he says, polos diftimus psychas, aidi proiopsin, trapped ahead of time. Not a chance to get out when you're in this situation. It's, just, it's a great tragic uh, situation, you know. And then that's the awful monster, death and hell. And, and it's a proper term. And the temporal shall deliver, uh, deliver up its dead, which is the grave. Now, he talks about here in this 12th verse, there's a spiritual death. The grave is the temporal death, and the resurrection has been taken care of by the atonement. You're going to be resurrected whether you want to or not. The spiritual death, you can have that. Now, that's real hell. That is hell, he says, of course, the spiritual death, which is hell. But the death and hell must deliver up their dead. The hell must deliver up its captive spirits. The graves and the bodies must deliver up, the uh, graves must deliver up captive bodies, and they're restored, notice, the one to the other, the spirit and the body 
are restored and the body will go on living and so will the spirit and it will be a horrible thing if you're going to be living in a sewer forever and ever. And this is restored the one to the other by the power of the resurrection. Oh, how great the plan of our God. I mentioned the last time the plan is not found in the Bible, yet it's found 42 times in the Book of Mormon, only two times in the Doctrine and Covenants, only two times in the Pearl of Great Price, but 42 times in the Book of Mormon and 36 times in the Book of Alma. Why should the whatever happened to plan? How did it drop out of the Bible and so forth? I say it's become popular with ministers today because, because it's a very comforting document, isn't it? To know that everything is running according to plan is certainly reassuring. Otherwise, comes the problem, you see, what is the meaning of it, where is it going, it's nothing, life becomes absolutely inane without some sort of plan and some sort of purpose, what are we here for, the questions we hear all the time, and, uh, but the plan, why was it ever thrown out by the church, was it in there, it's in the Book of Mormon, we see, we have these things in the Book of Mormon that match the, uh, the Old Testament all the way through, I was thinking of atonement, you see, in atonement, the Book of Mormon matches the Old Testament, but not, not the new, because of course, uh, it was, it, came first in the atonement, and it represents the old Hebrew doctrine of the atonement, which is center, centered around the temple, and it always talks about, it, uh, always talks of it in terms of the temple, of sacrifice, the shedding of blood, and the tent, and the embrace, and all the things that go uh, with, the, with the rites of atonement among the Jews, and these which the Nephites had. So this is what atonement is in their terms, and always the language in Nephi, and Alma, and all the others is the same imagery that's used in the Old Testament in describing the sacrifices of the temple, but the temple was lost and the Jews took over, uh, the, the rabbis took over who were learned men, but they were not priests, and you had something else. They did away with the plan, which was disturbing. Uh, they did away with the pre-existence, they did away with the council in heaven, uh, they did away with uh, with all sorts of things here having to do with this planet. Well, why, why, when it was such a good thing? It, it, because the school of Alexandria did, these, the philosophers took it over, and in their place you have the doctrines of St. Augustine. This takes the place of the plan. It's predestinatio ad damnationum, predestinatio ad salvationum. You're predestined to damnation, or you're predestined to salvation. There's nothing you can do about it. It's the will of God. It is the will of God in la sua volontà de nostra pace. It all depends on his will, as, as we've been dancing. So this is, this is the thing. Uh, St. Thomas takes it a long ways here. It's the will of God, and that's all you can do about it. It's, it's decided, and this is taken over by the Lutherans, and it's taken over by this predestination, by the Calvinists especially, uh, this doctrine of St. Augustine that... Uh, what happens to you is because you were predestined that way. And of course, you didn't live before you came here, you didn't earn it or anything like that. Oregon tells us that the early church, they taught that you earned your position here before you came here. That hasn't, but that has to be out, you see. Everything, all creation has to be instantaneously and simultaneously and complete. Everything is completely there all at once, so you have no background or anything. You just find yourself here, and what's going to happen to you depends entirely on the will of God, whether you were damned or whether you were blessed. And this is the, uh, this, this takes its place, and uh, so they didn't need it anymore. But, and they fought it. See, all these elements of the plan, they not only didn't like, but they fought uh, vigorously. You, you get that in something like uh, those many volumes of, of good enough. Well, then he goes on talking about uh, this thing here. The, uh, let's talk about, then the next, the spirit and the body is restored to itself and all men become immortal, having a perfect knowledge like unto us in the flesh, save their knowledge shall be perfect. We shall have a perfect knowledge of all our guilt and uncleanness. Uh, it is stored away right now. We have it all in us right now, for that matter. Uh, a good psychoanalyst can get most of it up without having to have a record book or any, any account of your wicked deeds or anything like that. It's, it's all stored right here. You're going to take it with you. And we'll have a perfect knowledge and the perfect knowledge of their enjoyment. All men pass the first death into life insomuch that they have become immortal and must appear before the judgment seat. It's going to be a time. And those that are filthy, you'll be filthy still. Don't think you'll be automatically purified, he says. And go to the everlasting fire prepared for them as a lake of fire, tor torment which is as a lake of fire and brimstone. Now then, 
And what do you have to do to avoid this? The righteous of the saints, the Holy One of Israel, they are they who have believed in the Holy One of Israel, they who have endured the crosses of the world and despised the shame of it. You're expected to do that. After all, what is the purpose of money? It's to avoid these things, isn't it? To avoid the crosses of the world and, this, and the shame of it. And this, according, they shall inherit the kingdom of God, and always the plan is the council in heaven prepared from the foundation of the world. Now, that's a scriptural passage, too. Well, why don't people believe it went down to the time the world was founded? There was a plan prepared, and uh, there it is again, according to the wisdom, the kingdom of God, which was prepared from the foundation of the world. He cometh to save all men if they will hearken to his voice. Now, here we come to a very interesting situation here about the reality of these things, the 21st verse. Notice that he may save all men if they will hearken unto his voice. Behold, he suffereth the pain of all men, yea, the pains of every living creature, both men, women, and children, who belong to the family of Adam. He atones for the family of Adam. And the question arises, how is it possible for anyone to suffer that much, to suffer the pains of all men living and of every living creature? The isn't there a limit to suffering? Well, there is a limit to physical suffering. Let me see, where do we... Uh, I think this goes a little later on. He carries us to... Uh, into Alma 3 and 7. Well, let's see this now then. Uh, we're just going to talk about this. How is it possible to suffer that much? Two things. How can you suffer for somebody else? And second, how can you suffer for everybody and everything, you see? Men, women, and children, every, the whole family of Adam. How can one person suffer that much? Well, uh, there's certainly a limit to physical suffering. We've all had pains and so forth. At a certain point, persons pass out and things like that. It's amazing what you can take. That's, there's no problem there at all. People in, uh, you read the, the uh, Solzhenitsyn or something like that, what they have to suffer in, in Russian uh, prison camps and so forth. And uh, there's a limit there. But what about mental suffering? There is no limit to it all, just as there is no limit to imagination. There is no limit to comprehension. And there is no limit to empathy. There's no limit to what you can comprehend and, and take in yourself. You know yourself that you can expand. There, there's no limit to it. And you can imagine with the Lord Jesus Christ, who is something, who is the Son of God, his capacity for those things is very real. He can really, and it tells us why he suffers. He says, for, for the sins and the abominations of his people. It's going to tell us later on. It says he, he sweated from every pore, and it wasn't from the pain of nails or a cross of thorns. Might even not have been aware of that. That all came first anyway. That physical suffering is great, but it's nothing compared to what he suffered. That passage, incidentally, uh, when it says that he sweat blood from every pore. Where is that? I've got to hear somewhere. Uh, is, uh, oh yes, it's in, um, it's in Mosiah. It's in Mosiah here, and uh, where he talks about it. But the, uh, this was one of the, one of the great points of criticism of the Book of Mormon, because they say, well, the circulation of the blood wasn't known until the time of Harvey, in the 17th century. And so how can he be talking about sweating blood from everyone? Well, they made a big thing of that, but of course, the word pore is an ancient word, Latin porous. You'll find it in, in, uh, in ancient works on medicine, in, uh, in Galen, in Hippocrates. And uh, they knew about pores, and they knew about sweat, and there are cases in which people did sweat blood. So it's not a point of knowing the circulation of the blood or the cause for that. It's a case of the fact that people did. And the thing is that he sweat blood at every point. So great was his anguish for the, because, it says, of the wickedness and abominations of his people, not because he was in an uncomfortable situation at all. That's the thing. But it is possible to suffer that. I'm sure it's possible for God to suffer that much. But remember, there's no limit to what you could suffer. And of course, we know this. Uh, physical suffering is a joke compared with mental anguish. I mean, mental anguish. Uh, uh, and such a thing as, as schizophrenia is unspeakably worse than any physical pain you could possibly. There's just no difference. So this is what the Lord suffered. And it, I say it's possible for, for him to suffer that much for every living creature. But how could it be vicariously uh, affect someone else? And there are various theories of that. Abelard, for example, as you know, atonement means various things. But the fact is that 
that uh, if I am fully aware <coughs> of his suffering for me, I should be terribly afflicted by that too. That should, that should upset me terribly as far as that goes. That was one of the purposes of the crucifixion, according to one medieval according to Anselm, Helm, especially to Abelard. He says, the thought of it fills us so with pity and anguish and remorse and so forth that we repent when we think of that. It does affect us. It does change our lives if we talk about that. And he says, unto repentance. Well, the... Uh, <coughs> he suffereth this, that the resurrection might pass upon all men, that it might stand, that might stand before him, that the, before him at the great judgment. That's the atonement again. He commands all men that they must repent and be baptized, in his name having a perfect faith. But 99% of men haven't been baptized, he tells us next. He says, if, but if they will not repent and believe in his name and be baptized in his name and endure to the end, they must be damned. That is it, you see, because they have refused, they have despised it, they've turned it down. But if you've never heard about it, that's the 25th verse here, you see, 99, I say 99% at least. He has given a law, there is no law, and there is no punishment, where there's no condemnation, where the people, where he has given the law, and where there is no law, he says, wherefore, he has given the law that they should endure, they should uh, not refuse it, they will be damned, and so forth. But the law is, there's no punishment and no condemnation if people haven't heard the law. The mercies of the Holy One of Israel have claim upon them because of the atonement that, that frees them, for they are delivered by the power of him. For the atonement satisfies the demands of justice. And, uh, and those who have not the law given to them, that's what he's talking about here, and I say that's the vast majority of the human family, of course, this is the whole rationale of the temple work, everything behind it. Which, and this is, again, this is another thing the, atone, the, the Jews very firmly believe in, and the rabbis still teach, as a matter of fact, atonement for the dead. What can you do for them? They say there are three things you can do for them. Uh, you can pray for them, you can give alms for them, uh, and you can study the scripture for them. That's the best you can do. But anciently, it all went back to the temple, and it was in the time of the Maccabees that that, that, that was lost. Very interesting story. They, the temple was primarily for a work they did use for, for the dead, which still survives in the Kadusha, which is the prayer for the dead, which is on the Day of Atonement. See? That's when you bring all things together, and you have the, the Kadusha, which is the prayer for the dead. But here he's talking about those who, who've never had the chance, the law not given to them. They are restored to that God who gave them breath. That's fair enough. But woe unto him that has the law given. And then he says, that has all the commands of the God, like us. We have them, he says, like unto us and that transgresseth them, and wasteth the day of his probation, for awful is his state. Now, what is sin? Sin is waste. That's all it is, after all. It's the misdirection of life. You use your energies, you use your appetites, desires, and passions, you use your gifts and everything else, and you misdirect them, you waste them. You have a limited time here, you're, you're given your, your great chance, and to waste that, you can't, can you think of any sin that isn't waste? I mean, even the most vilely immoral things, because what are they wasting? You see? That's waste in a big way, you see. It, it always tears down, it always destroys, you always lose something by it. Something you can't get by and get back again. So you dig yourself deeper and deeper in with sin, and the whole thing is waste. It's waste and loss. Yachasara, you see what I'm saying? It's, it is lost. Because you've misdirected all your enemies, and that certainly is what sin is. You know. uh, again, of course, it's a state of mind. An act which can be virtuous in one, uh, in one situation can be wicked in another, as far as that goes. But again, you see, there's the waste of your, your insight, your mental e energy, and all the rest, and the misdirection of it. But he says, oh, that cunning plan of the evil, and there's your plan again. He has his plan too, you see. Oh, the vainness and frailties and the foolishness of men. This is a, an outburst of the wisdom literature. There is a great, there's more being written today about Hebrew wisdom literature and Egyptian literature, they're being compared today the first time in a big way. Everybody and his dog is writing about Hebrew, and they, they always suspected they were very much alike because the Egyptian is full of Bible quotations. The Egyptians, they wouldn't, wouldn't accept them. The Egyptologists would know that they wouldn't know that's, that's, that's impossible, that can't be. They explained it as pure coincidence. Well, anyway, today it's the big thing that the wisdom literature of the Jews and the Egyptians is very much alike, and it has to do there are things having to do with the folly of men. They're teaching of wisdom and the ways of getting along in the world and so forth. There's an also a wisdom that breaks out into, uh, into oration like this and becomes very eloquent. That cunning plan of the evil and all the vainness and frailties and foolishness of men. See, they're hopeless. When they're learned, they think they're wise and they hearken not to the counsel of God, for they set aside, supposing they know of themselves 
It's a very interesting thing. Wherefore, their wisdom is foolishness, and it profiteth them not, and they shall perish. The Egyptians have an interesting word for everything. It's netet yutet. And you can write on the board, it's a very simple thing. Uh, it means netet yutet, that means whatever is, and yutet is whatever is not. The word is everything. When I say everything, that means everything I know about, and also everything I don't know about, because that exists too. And the part I don't know about is vastly larger than the part I do know about. So when I think of the idea that I've covered a subject, or that I know everything, or to use the word everything is folly, unless you use the other thing, what I know and what I don't know. Everything you tell which is there, and also the stuff which is not there, which we're not aware of. The, the two parts, existence, reality, includes two things, doesn't it? And we say it only includes one. That's the principle of Descartes. He says it's necessary to assume that all you have is all there is, because otherwise you're not going to be able to argue, you're not going to be able to form your syllogisms and so forth, unless you assume that what you have is what there, what's there. Because you can't calculate, you can't put the other in your calculation, you can't use that in your, though some sophisticated mathematics does, of course, you have to make allowance for, for what isn't there. But to the Egyptians, you always, whenever you said you knew something, but there was also a subject, there's also the part we don't know. Always consider that, which is the greater part. We just know a little tiny bit. But these people, they suppose they know of themselves. And of course, their wisdom is foolishness. I say this is just out of this, this wisdom literature, he has a, which was available for all these people. Wherefore, their wisdom is foolishness, and it profiteth them not, and they shall perish, because it's not going to get them anywhere. But to be learned is good if they counsel, uh, hearken to the counsels of God, the other part they don't know. And then all of a sudden he breaks out into this. Uh, he's been talking about the plan, notice in the 28th verse, oh, that cunning plan. And all of a sudden he says, but woe unto the rich. Well, as I said, that implements the plan. This is money. This is the way it's done. He gives this long list of horrendous offenses here. Uh, those uh, disobedient, the liar, the murderer, the whoredoms, the idols, uh, die on their sin. but the head of the list is the rich. And he states as a general principle, because they are rich, they despise the poor. Otherwise, they would be, wouldn't be rich. They'd follow another course. But this is what implements the other plan that he just talked about, that vain, cunning plan of the evil one. As we said, I will take the treasures of the earth. And of course, the one he, he works it out on is Cain. He makes his covenants with Cain. He goes through all, the, he has an atonement with Cain, and they, they, they become one, and Cain, what does he do? Now I am free, his property falls into my hands, he says, because money will make him free. And uh, so, they despise the poor, persecute the meek, and their hearts are upon their treasures. I say otherwise, they wouldn't have them. Wherefore, their treasure is their God. Uh, your, your portfolio, your Dow Jones rating, I mean, you, you live by your portfolio. Nobody cares about anything else anymore. And behold, their treasure shall perish with them also, because it's temporal treasure. It will perish, yes. How can we know when we're rich? Hmm? How can we know when we're rich? Well, that's a very interesting thing. Rich is defined very well by Brigham Young, defined very well by Paul uh, to the uh, in Timothy, uh, Second Timothy, isn't it? Uh, Having food and raiment, let us be there with content. For who has, who seeks for more, falls into temptation and the snare. And there, he uses the word trapped in the rapids, the same word that Sophocles uses in the same situation. They get caught in the rapids, they get swept along. He says, by many foolish desires, wishes, and lusts, they, they want to know, want more and more. There's no limit to what you can want. I mean, that's a proverb you'll find all over the place. It's, uh, the Greek tragedies are full of it and so forth. There's no limit to the greed of a person. The more they get, the more they want and so forth. These are well-known truisms. But uh, having food and raiment, let us be there with content. If you want more than that, you're in real trouble, he says, because you are. And he says, this has brought many from the faith because they want more than that. And uh, the, they despise the poor and the meek. If you have more than you need, of course, you are rich. If you have less than you need, you're poor. And uh, there should be some sort of balance. But by very definition, you see, you have more than you, you possibly can need or eat. And if you're poor, you have less than you need or eat. And the, the solution is obvious, isn't it? We're not going to do that, no. Uh, and the witches shall perish also. Well, we know classic examples of that. Citizen Cain, we all have seen that old classic and so forth. The sadness of it, the tragedy of it. He surrounds himself with all this junk, you know, and more and more and more to make him feel secure. And this was William Randolph Hearst. He did that. He had his great inherited wealth, and he also added to it his newspaper and so forth, though he lost a lot on that. But he went to San Simeon, he started collecting this junk about him, and he had one rule. Uh, Professor H.R.W.S. Smith used to go down there to catalog his collection of uh, 
of Roman vases. He had a great collection of Roman vases and so forth, and Professor Smith would go down to catalog him and like. But uh, he, he refused on no circumstances should the word death ever be mentioned in his presence, as if he could avoid it, you know. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, the, uh, I was going to say Julian, uh, wrote a novel about it, Huxley. It wasn't Julian Huxley, it was, about, it was his brother. Uh, I'll his name in a second. I'm really gone today, I'm so no good at all. Uh, that's happening too often now, isn't it? All these, all these projects going at once. Well, anyway, uh, Huxley, uh, Aldous Huxley, writes this book, After Many a Summer. It's very good. It's about William Randolph. It's a novel, you see, about this man who, uh, his doctor finally invented a cure, a nauseating cure to extend his life indefinitely. For a long time, it was the, it was the floral, uh, intestinal flora of a carp. If you eat that, it will make you will restore your hormones and so forth, so he ate that and so forth, but it caught, caught up with him finally. But it is sad, you see, that, you, that it has to come to the richest and you collect all your riches and then you have the dead hand, you want to keep it in the family. It haunts the English families, of course, all this thing going down and trying to, trying to hang on to it. so tragic, you can't save a dead hand in law. You keep this property after you're dead, you want to make sure that you have control of it after you're dead. Well, of course, that's perfectly silly, but that's an obsession with us. We just want, but they're their treasure will perish with them, and that's all there is to it, and nothing you can do about it. Sorry about that. Uh, and then to go woe into them, and notice uh, they, they do not know themselves. They have a completely false self-image here, and hence the fine apparel and the rest. And woe into the deaf that will not hear, that is when they can, for they shall perish. <coughs> they have the chance, you see. And woe unto the blind that will not see, for they shall perish also. And woe unto the uncircumcised of heart, for a knowledge of their iniquity shall smite them at the last day. They'll keep it with them, don't worry. And they don't, uh, and uh, they'll know themselves then, you see. A knowledge of their iniquity shall smite them. It will catch up with them. It'll really hit them then, but Freud tells us it catches up with us right now. You can't escape from it, you see. It will, ex it will come out in all your neuroses and your, your rashes and your ulcers and things like that. And uh, you'll be a terrible, miserable person because you cannot cover these things up. You, you know they're wrong. And you'll know yourself then, and woe unto the liar, he shall be thrust down to hell, and the murderer that deliberately killeth, for he shall die, this list of offenders. Woe unto them who commit whoredoms, for they shall be thrust down, and those who worship idols, for the devil of all devils delighteth in them. In fine, in short, he says, finally, woe unto all those who die in their sins, for they shall return to the God, to God, and behold his face, and remain in their sins. That's going to be pretty horrible, isn't it? Of course, there. There are ways out, but it's going to be an awful time, you see. Oh, my beloved brethren, remember the awfulness of transgressing against that holy God. This is absolute, you see now. And here again, the, uh, and also the awfulness of yielding to the enticings of that cunning one. Remember, the carnally minded is death, and to be spiritually minded is life. This enticement, and what is his number one enticement? I don't need to tell you what that is. Uh, in Alma, I think it's 30 and... Uh, Oh, no, it's, it's, it's Moroni 7 and 30. That enticement is a very interesting thing. He mentioned that before. Uh, seven. Oh, I've got the wrong book. Moroni, if I'm not mistaken, is the last one. Here it is, then. Uh, <coughs> Covenants and Miracles. Oh, come on, you must be here. Uh, no, that was that other thing I was thinking of, but this is in the same, same thing. Anyway, I can cite it for you anyway. That Satan inviteth and enticeth men to sin. Oh, here it is in the 13th verse of Moroni 7, not the 31st, 13th. But behold, notice, the devil is an enemy to God and fighteth against him continually and inviteth and enticeth to sin to do that which is evil continually. So there's a constant drag, just like gravitation. It is working steadily, constantly, inviting and enticing to sin. And on the other hand, the next verse, see, but behold, that which is of God inviteth and enticeth to do good continually. And you have the two pulling in opposite directions there to decide which orbit you will go in. But it's up to you to decide which one you're going to take, isn't it? There is the force equal? Or if it was overpowering in either, in either direction, you see, you'd have a good excuse. As I said last time, you'd say it was too strong for you. You couldn't resist it. So naturally, you wouldn't have a chance, but you're in the middle now here. 
and you're being enticed and invited in one direction and enticed and invited in another. And, and of course, uh, the one seems to have an overpowering drag now. Uh, like that poem by Clarence Day, Might and right are always fighting, in our youth it seems exciting. Right is always nearly winning, might can hardly keep from grinning. <laughs> well, no laughs, but I think that's a very funny poem. Uh, but we're back to Second Nephi here and nine. So, uh, oh, there are iniquities to all right now. How often the enticings in, in either direction. And what is the enticing he used? You know the number one, the one thing we can't exist, the one thing resist, the one thing you can't do anything without, the one thing you can do everything with, and so forth. I won't name the dirty word, we'll just go on here. Uh, and now is the time, again, notice, notice here, when he talks about repentance, he says, now is the time of it. They think they know of themselves. Their wisdom is foolish. It profiteth not and shall perish. Now, repentance is knowing yourself. The Greeks called it that. Note yourself down. To know what you are, to recognize what you are. It's a painful process. The first step you make is to recognize your situation, what you really are, and so forth, to face yourself. Uh, you're not going to repent unless you do that. And that is very painful. And uh, the... Very simple definition of repentance, though, is to look yourself to him. And that was written above the doorway of the shrine of Delphi, the holiest center of wisdom in the ancient world. Know thyself. And may the Nagan. Do not say that I've spoken any hard things against you. Uh, well, how often do we preach these things today anyway? We don't like them. Because notice these are not smooth things to use the... Uh, remember they asked Isaiah, speak to us smooth things. We listen to you if you talk smooth things. You get this later in Abinadi and a lot of other prophets. We speak the things that we want to hear, but you don't need to hear those things. If the, God, if the Bible only told us what we wanted to hear, we wouldn't need it. Because we, and yet those are the things we're willing to hear. And the other things we can smooth over very easily. Uh, the words from the prophets, we wouldn't need them. I say if they, if they were not hard to take there, no. And so Isaiah says, the people say, speak to us smooth things. Uh, the false prophets are only glad to oblige. For the righteous fear them not, for they love the truth and are not shaken. A real test. But now, here's the other inscription from Delphi, is Maiden Agan. Nothing in excess. Not means follow the straight and narrow. You don't go too far to this side or too far to that side. It means you must be strict, remember? in the long road, as he, as he says, escaping from his enemies. Behold, the way for man for man is narrow, but it lieth in a straight course. So you can stay on it, all right, before him. And here's one of, the most, one of my favorite verses from the Book of Mormon. This is really a beauty, you know. And the keeper of the gate is the Holy One of Israel, and he employeth no servant there. Now, what a comfort to, in that, you see, to know that there's no middle management, uh, there are no officious clerks. Uh, this is one of the great resounding passages that he will take your hand personally and identify himself, show you the signs and tokens, as he does, remember, when he comes to the Nephites, one by one, even the children, one by one, and gives them each a personal blessing. Well, he said, that would take forever and ever. Well, don't be surprised. That can, there's plenty of time and so forth. And, and, and speaking of these, uh, there are certain things that are not limited. Uh, uh, John Hayes, I like to tell this story, John, because he was my next door neighbor. John Hayes, who lived next to us, was uh, registrar at the BYU for 40 years. And uh, he knew the name and family history and personal taste and dislike of every student who ever registered here. He was just an ordinary man, but he was interested in it. And the person had come back 20 years later, and he'd asked the most intimate things about it. Uh, uh, did your father ever get over his gout or something like that? How is that possible for one person? If it, if it had been there for another 10 years, it would have been the same thing. Thousands and thousands of names and people and just, just knew them. And that was that. Because he was the registrar. He had worked at it. And, and he wasn't chosen as registrar because he had that talent. He just developed it. And it's a marvelous thing to be able to do things like that, to know that there's no limit to some things. And so it's the same with the Lord. He knows you by name personally. He, uh, he doesn't stand up on the balcony with a million people in front of him, wave your hand and say, bless you children, and that's it. This is the way it does. This is all, all a very personal thing, the Messiah. That's why the Book of Mormon and, the, of course, the Bible speaks so warmly of these things, that he is ours and we are our Savior and so forth. He has saved us and we, are uh, and we are indebted to him. But it's straight and narrow that leads to them. That means no compromise. 
Uh, this is nature's fine tuning. You see, that's, that's what makes life, we mentioned before, that's what makes life possible in the universe, is this not going to the right or the left, keeping to the straight and narrow. Well, they say that's so narrow-minded, not narrow-minded. That's the only thing that makes life possible, this fine tuning. If the earth was too far or too near from the sun, no life. If it was too hot, too cold, no life. If it was went too fast or too slow, no life, and so forth. Everything has to be just right. There are 15, they tell us, the physicists tell us that there are 15 um, major uh, constants that have to be finely tuned that way. And when you get them all together, the chances are of getting a world that are infinitesimally uh, remote, then you're going to then you're going to get a world where people live and so forth. And uh, so here is the personal greeting we get. Notice, whoso knocketh at the gate, to him he will open. Notice, he is the keeper of the gate, and if you knock at the gate, he will give you that personal greeting. And uh, incidentally, uh, the atonement, as we're told, remember, there was no other who could pay the price of sin. The atonement makes the delegation of his authority impossible. He's not going to delegate it. No, he's the keeper of the gate. He employs no servant there. Because we're talking about the entombment. When he greets you, this is the, this is the embrace, you see, we're talking about, which they call, the, it's the kippur, that's the Jewish the kippur, uh, which is the embrace at the veil of the, of the kippur. That's the kippur, that's the veil of the, of the uh, tabernacle, the ark's inside. But when the Lord receives Israel on the day of atonement, you see, the Lord says, the Lord speaks from the tent and accepts the sacrifice and accepts Israel. Uh, but again, you see, there's only one who can atone. No one else can do that. So, of course, he can't, he's not going to delegate. He's atoned for you, and he's not going to delegate to anybody else. And uh, believe me, that's reassuring. And notice, but you, he knock and he'll open, but what if you come to him wise and learned and rich and puffed up and because of your learning and your wisdom and your riches, they are they whom he despiseth. Now, this is the most terrifying verse in the Book of Mormon, the idea of God despising anything since he loves all creatures and loves them completely. How could he, well, the word is despicio, the person at the gate looks down. You see the gatekeeper always in the little, the little thing, uh, the, the keeper's down below, but above the gate. That's the gate of appearances, that's where the family looks down and so forth. In Egypt you have some beautiful things. Above the gate of the temple there's a balcony, or the palace, it's not the temple, the palace. There's a balcony and there's where the royal family goes and when visitors come they look down on them. But despicio means to look down on and he says, and he will not open to them. See, he looks down, sees them and he will not open to them. He, he, the, the gate is kept closed. Yea, they are they whom he despises. That's a terrible thing because this is self-deification. That's what it amounts to. I mean, the person who tells him, I've heard this from various teachers and so forth. Look, uh, God and all that stuff, that's silly religion of yours. So many of my friends believed that not only that this that was absurd and uh, they wouldn't believe it, but they didn't believe I believed it. They didn't believe for a minute that I believed this stuff. Now, isn't that funny? They, that was self-deification. They say, look, you've got it all wrong. I'll tell you how it is. I'll give you the answers. Now, that is deifying yourself in the, in the field of knowledge, and that's what they do, actually push themselves out. I mean, when you see, uh, uh, when you see uh, Carl Sagan making a pronouncement denouncing Plato as he does at any kind of, of religion as he does, and then he looks up into the sky while a celestial chorus sings in the background and an aura of holy light plays around him and so forth, and the vastness of space is shown. And there you know, there's no God, but here is the, the greatest thing in the universe right here, and it's Carl Sagan. And they build it up to look just like that. I mean, they have the, they have the cosmic background, I say, they have the swelling music, uh, they have the, uh, so the ethereal light and all the rest of it, so this, uh, this guy can show that, that he's, he's the great, he's God, you see. Well, you see, that's the sort of thing that God is going to despise. <laughs> you think you can displace him, names and poops. Uh, oh, my beloved brethren, remember my words. Behold, I take off my garments and shake them before you. Of course, that was the ancient custom. And in the oration on the crown, Demosthenes talks about it when a person is vanished from Athens, where he shakes it. But Paul, number to the Corinthians, both in his uh, in Acts and in, in Acts when he visited the, uh, in the book of Corinthians, uh, when uh, Acts one fourteen also, he says to the Corinthians, "I thank God, I baptized none of you. I shake you off my feet." And so he gets rid of them. But it's in first uh, in the uh, in First Corinthians we're told how how he does it. It's First Corinthians one fourteen. It's Acts. Uh, 18 and 6, that's right, where he, he denounces the Corinthians and says, 
Henceforward, I go to the Gentiles. I'm through with you. But how he does it is in the beginning, right? In the beginning of his letter to the Corinthians. Uh, that's what it would be, you see. Where he says, I shake my garments. I shake you. I'm free of your blood. I testify this day. He shakes his garments before he does it literally. I testify that I am free of your blood this day. And uh, then uh, he says, uh, yes, that's what he says. He's, he he um, shakes his garments before them to show that, they, that he is free of their blood and he's going to leave them. And then the other, he says, uh, and goes to the Gentiles uh, because he's through with the Jewish uh, community at Corinth. And that's a very, it's a dramatic gesture. It was the, the robe, uh, it was on the, uh, it was on Mars Hill in Athens where the, the chief priest would, would shake, it was a bright red robe, it was a scarlet robe, and a person was banished. He'd, shake the robe, shake him off, get rid of him, but it's shaking the dust off your feet of a, of a rebellious town or wicked people. That is used in Acts, a good deal, shaking the dust off their feet. So. But Paul shakes his, uh, his garments. He does the same thing here. And so he says, my beloved friend, behold, I shake my garments and take them off before I say it's a very old custom. It was, was full-blown in Lehi's day. I pray God of my salvation that he view me with an all-searching eye. He wants to be tested that day when men shall be judged of their works, that the God of Israel did witness that I shook your iniquities from my soul, that I stand with, the brightness, with brightness before him and I am rid of your blood. Uh, notice, uh, he can only advise them, uh, and he cannot assume uh, the guilt of another, not responsibly. He says, well, what's he doing, getting rid of his responsibility? Yes, he's rid of their blood now. Uh, he can advise them, but he... He can't assume guilt for them. They're responsible for their own doing, so he leaves them now. And he says this. Notice showing again that things are going, not going too well with the Nephites here. He says, oh, my beloved brethren, shake off. Notice he picks it up. Now let's shake off the chains. You notice this, this tie, where they connect the tie words together here. Oh, brethren, shake off the chains of him that would bind you. You shake that. See, I'm shaking my garments. Now you, you do a bit of shaking, too. Uh, to, and come to that God who is the rock of your salvation. But you must do this yourself, you know. You shake off the chains. Do that. Prepare your souls for the glorious day. He ends on an upbeat here. And when you, that you may not remember your awful guilt in perfectness. You need no accuser. I say, you remember your guilt, all right. Not necessary. Holy, holy are thy judgments. to say, well, say that God's judgments are just. And this is what you'll have to say. I know my guilt. Notice it's all individual, as the scripture says. Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. You can't justify your dirty work by the fact that everybody is doing it. And so we have here, you have to say, I know my guilt. I transgress thy law. My transgressions are mine. The devil has obtained me, and I am a prey to his awful misery. And that's the saddest thing about him, of course, is he's utterly miserable. Wants others to be miserable like him. But you say, well, that's absurd, isn't it? Why should anyone want to be miserable? Well, you, you tell me. That's what we see all around us. Nothing but Miserable people make themselves miserable, and why do they need to do this? So, behold, my brethren, notice this is it. He, he says, I'm talking about real things here in this next verse, 47. Behold, my brethren, it's expedient that I should wake you to an awful reality of these things. You think that we're just talking a lot of old-fashioned tribal mumbo-jumbo or something like that. Well, not a bit, of he says. Uh, and this is where we all fall down, you see. We don't, don't really accept the reality of things. We don't take them seriously enough as far as that goes. Uh, and again, Jacob is not popular, we get from this. They don't like him to preach this way. And uh, later in the book of Jacob, he, he really bears down on them even more. He says, if you were holy, I'd speak unto you of holiness. But as you're not holy, and I look, you look upon me as a teacher, you ask for it, says he. And uh, come to me, and then he's back to this again. Come to me, my brethren, everyone that thirsteth. Ye, come ye to the waters, he that hath no money. See, he keeps digging on that. Because as we learn at the beginning of the book of Jacob, they started finding an awful lot of, of rich minerals around here, and they started hoarding this stuff and uh, getting very class conscious about it and so forth. He that hath no money, and remember, this is a very characteristic of barbarians, to load yourself with all, uh, with all you can, you know, women of Central Asia and so forth. Well, I've lived in communities where the women uh, wear all the money, all the family fortune right around their neck, all these gold and silver coins, heavy, massive, right around their neck is both for display and because it's in the family, I mean, the, the idea that people uh, are, are interested in, in collecting uh, vast wealth doesn't come with civilization at all. That's a barbaric trait. The barbarics live by loot and plunder, as you know. And the more you get, they take their wagons along, and the, the, 
the ruler is able to rule because he is, as, as uh, Skill Skeffing was at the beginning of Beowulf, that was called Kuning. That was a good king because, of because he gave out many gold rings and many gifts, and then he got his followers. He bought his followers that way. That's the way you do. He'd go and loot with his men, and then he would reward them by sharing the loot among them. And you go way back to home, you find the whole thing. The same thing where the great rivalry and bitterness among the great lords of Troy that wrecks everything is because one person is jealous of another's need of honor. He got more than the other did in the big, when they divided up the swag, because these people are just looters, that's what they're doing, they're pirates. And uh, they're always, I say, jealous of the meat of honor, they're quarreling, Cair de la Fron, you dog face, uh, he says to the king, you see, uh, because he didn't get enough, he says to Agamemnon, he calls him, Achilles calls Agamemnon a, do a greedy dog face, he says. Nothing ever satisfied you. You always grab the most when he says, when they're in a division, you're right there to the grab. And I notice he says, when the battle's on, I'm the one that does all the work. That's the way they were all talking and thinking, you see. So this is the sort of thing that was happening in Jacob's community. They were dividing it up and uh, getting pretty nasty as we get in the book of Jacob. Don't do that, he says. Come to the Holy One of Israel and feast upon that which perisheth not. There's no money. Behold, my beloved brethren, remember the words of, you, of God and pray unto him continually day and night. Well, is this the Arabic fatra? The fatra is a prayer that you never stop uttering, day and night. I mean, if you're doing any rhythmic work, a Muslim, a pious Muslim, does any rhythm, if he saws it, you have to say, Allah, Allah, the name of God, with every blow, or hammering, or walking. They do an awful lot of walking, you see, in the desert. You, you Allah, 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 and so forth. Always, that's the fatra, the unceasing prayer. But this is talking, of course, in, in the normal thing. We do things constantly. You say, means constantly and regularly when you do it continually. You say he fasted continually, or he studied continually, or he exercised continually, or he was a man who smiled continually. That doesn't mean he never stopped in his sleep or anything like that. It means on a regular, reliable, constant basis, and that's what we do when we pray continually by day and give thanks to him, his holy name, by night. You see, the, your, pr your prayers in the day and your prayers at night, and let your hearts rejoice. There's no reason why this can't be fun, he says. There's no reason why sh we shouldn't enjoy this. And, and he ends on a, an encouraging note here. Now about these promises and so forth, in spite of all this, he tries to be cheerful. Remember, he's promised to us that our seed should not utterly be destroyed. That's the best he can do, not utterly be destroyed, which isn't so good, of course, according to the flesh but that he would preserve them, and in the future generations they shall become a righteous branch unto the house of Israel. That's good news. Now I, Jacob, speak unto you again concerning this righteous branch I have spoken. Now, this is a prophetic one, <coughs> and uh, the prophetic verse, and this goes for the land of promise and so forth. First, there's a review of what's, happened, what's to happen in Israel, and of course, the author of this book could have picked it up uh, from the Bible easy enough, this part. But then when we get to the ninth verse, then he starts prophesying into the future here. And since that was 150 years ago, we can start checking up on that and see if that's the direction that's gone in. So he starts out, uh, many of our children shall perish in the flesh, that happens, but our children shall be restored. It must needs be expedient, here goes in the third verse, that Christ should come among the Jews and they shall crucify him. I say he could have got that elsewhere. And because of their priestcrafts and iniquities, they at Jerusalem will stiffen their necks against him that he shall be crucified. The gospel doesn't have a chance, does it, anywhere, it seems. And as a result, uh, they shall be destroyed, uh, and bloodshed shall come upon them, and they who shall not be destroyed shall be scattered among all the nations. Of course, that was the great destruction of 70 and of 130, when it was capital punishment for a Jew to be found in Jerusalem. But here, those that weren't destroyed, and the destroy, destruction was massive, as we can see from the Dead Sea Scrolls alone, you see, uh, and, well, from Josephus, naturally, and scattered, the rest were scattered among all nations, and they're much more widely scattered than we think. Uh, I remember when, uh, when I was studying with Professor Popper, only pupil, uh, in came a, came a person from central China. That, in those days, people didn't get back to there. I didn't get back into inmost Asia. And he came in and we were all excited to meet him. He came in Professor Popper's office and he was a Jew, uh, from central, belonged to a community of Jews out there in, in Central Asia, lost tribes or something like that that nobody ever heard about. But they are scattered in places where you don't expect them. Yes, he says, we have lots of Jews out there and they're, they're scattered all over out there in, on the plains. Uh, when the day cometh that they shall believe in me, then he shall remember the covenant with their fathers. And then he talks about the 
shall come to pass, they shall be gathered, shall be gathered together. Then the gathering, of course, this is important. I mean, this is the standard pattern we have before, so in this 10th chapter here. And the kings of the Gentiles shall be nursing fathers unto them, uh, which they have been, of course, all through the, the ages. Nursing fathers, whether they wanted to be or not, unconsciously or not. Remember, uh, you, we talked about the, the royal, various royal families that you find in the Assizes of Jerusalem, for example, that ruled the world, all, all related to each other throughout Europe and so forth, but all heavily intermarried with Jews, especially Jewish women, who had an irresistible appeal to the kings and princes and dukes of Europe. And, of course, their, uh, their, their main ministers of finance and the, men they, the smart Jews they depended on, like uh, Abravanel, who financed Columbus, and uh, uh, Joseph Oppenheimer, who financed uh, the Duke of Saxony and uh, these important men, and uh, they could be thrown out on a moment's notice. They had no rights, no defense at all, but they were mingled everywhere, and of course for 700 years. They were not in, only in France, but in Toulouse. He mentioned Toulouse the last time. Well, Toulouse was practically a, a Jewish enclave. It, it was, became Muslim. The Muslims were very tolerant for a while, as you know, the kingdom of, became the kingdom of Toulouse. But there was, was a Jewish center, mostly of those who had fled from Palestine, uh, from Jerusalem when it was destroyed at the time of Christ. They came mostly southern France. You find them all along there in the, in, in the Vaudois and so forth. And when I was on a mission, it was a very interesting thing. I went up to a village, uh, uh, practically a lost village in the Black Forest. It was called Pinache, and I, the French name attracted me, so I went up and attracted. And they immediately gobbled up the gospel. Uh, they all, I noticed in the, in the, uh, in the uh, cemetery, they all had French names and so forth. Well, they were Waldenses who'd been driven out in the 17th century and come there and settled and lived by themselves and married among themselves and taught these things and they were just waiting for the gospel. It's a remarkable thing. And immediately a man came all the way down to Durlock so he could come to meeting and see what was going on. But these little enclaves and so forth are scattered everywhere where you don't know. When he says the Jews are scattered everywhere, it really means it. On the Isles of the Sea, you see their features everywhere and things like that, uh, which you don't expect. Well, the time is more than up now and we'd better 